Welcome to the last part of this video series, part seven. In this part, we're gonna jump back to my 2004 runner because remember, we started with my 2004 runner because mine is stock and most people are gonna have a stock setup. They're not gonna have a supercharger like Sean has on his 2002 Forerunner. So we're gonna build up the upper part of my engine from the intake manifold, get the plenums on, get the throttle body on, make all the cable connections, hose connections, get the air box and air tube back on, get the battery back on. And then we're gonna switch back to Sean's engine. He's already got the supercharger back on and all the other connections he needed to make. And we're gonna cross our fingers and hope this sucker starts. So without further ado, let's get out to my 2004 runner and build up the top end of my engine. The first thing I'm gonna reinstall is my spark plug wires. I'm gonna lay it on top of the upper timing cover. I'm gonna snap these in place. I'm gonna drop the spark plug wires into the driver's side cylinder. With the OEM wires, you really can't mess this up because they're all sized to the right length. So the longest one goes to the rear, the next longest one in the center. So get them in there and then snap them down. The OEM wires are done a little bit differently than aftermarket wires. Right in this area, you're gonna have that air chamber stay. And one nice thing that the NGK company does is they make this number six wire a little bit longer so you can route it around the air chamber stay and it makes it easier for you to get this boot off in the future with the air chamber stay in the way. That's an advantage over the OEM setup. These OEM wires are cut to the exact length and they have to route this way. They can't go around the air chamber stay. And I'm just gonna plug this into this fuel rail right here. There's a clip right there for it. I'm gonna jump over to the other side and we're gonna get the coil packs in. I got my coil packs, I'm gonna drop them in. It doesn't really matter if you mix these up. They're all the same coil pack. I decided to number mine, but don't worry about knowing which was which. They're all the same. And now I got to get my 10 millimeter bolts and lock them in place. No torque value for these. I'm just going to cinch them up snug with a small quarter inch ratchet. If you're worried about a torque value, I would say a good torque spec for these is 80 inch pounds because it's a small 10 millimeter bolt. I'm gonna clip the spark plug wire harness into this upper timing cover right here. And then I'm gonna plug in the spark plug wires into the coil packs. Just make sure they snap in place. And then I'm gonna make the harness connections to the coil packs right now. Next, I'm gonna get the lower plenum in place. Make sure you put your plenum gasket over the intake manifold. I'm gonna start with this long bolt in the center and get that one started. On the front and rear, there's a nut. And then facing the passenger side, there's two other bolts. I'm just snugging them up with uh, Milwaukee and then I'll switch to a torque wrench. The torque spec for the lower plenum nuts and bolts is 13 foot pounds. I'm using my inch pound torque wrench and the conversion is 156 inch pounds. The lower plenum is properly torqued to the intake manifold. I'm gonna reconnect this small hose that leads to the fuel pressure regulator. And then there's a engine harness connection right here and it's held to the lower plenum with a 10 millimeter bolt and I'm gonna get that bolt installed. I'm just tightening this up with a quarter inch ratchet and 10 millimeter socket, just go by feel. Okay, that's good. Now we're gonna jump onto the driver's side of the lower plenum and I'm gonna get the bolts installed that secure the fuel rail to the lower plenum. It's held with two small 10 millimeter bolts. I'm just gonna tighten these by feel also, using the quarter inch ratchet. Okay, those are tight. 
Next, I'm gonna install the upper plenum. Just like the lower plenum, there's nuts on the front and rear. There's two shorter bolts that go on the driver's side, and then there's two longer bolts that go on the passenger side of the upper plenum. One right here, and then the other one right here in the back. I'm gonna cinch them up first with the Milwaukee ratchet. Now I'm gonna torque the bolts and nuts. Same torque value as a lower plenum. It's 13 foot pounds or 156 inch pounds. I'm gonna make some hose connections. This hose right here leads down to a nipple on the back side of the driver's side valve cover. Slide that one over. This one leads over to the EVAP canister right here. And this is a new hose. Mine was split really bad. And then this is an easy clamp. You could just squeeze it with your fingers. I'm gonna reconnect the ground wire for the diagnostic port. I'm just tightening it with a quarter inch ratchet. No torque value, just use your best judgment. Okay, that's tight. I'm gonna slide the diagnostic port onto the bracket it connects to. Next, I'm gonna reconnect the air chamber stay that bolts to the lower plenum and bolts to the head. This part right here just captures the transmission kickdown cable. It keeps it away from the exhaust manifold. You have two bolts, a 12 millimeter head and a 14 millimeter head. The 12 millimeter one goes to the plenum. And I gotta reach down here, get it connected to the driver's side head. To tighten up the 14 millimeter bolt down lower that connects the air chamber stay to the head, I'm gonna use a 3 8 ratchet flex head with a 14 millimeter socket. It's a little bit hard to get on there, but what I'm doing is I'm using my right hand pushing up against the head of the ratchet to keep the socket on the 14 millimeter bolt. And then I'm working the ratchet handle with my left hand. Okay, that's tight. The upper one is way easier to access. Okay, and that's tight. Next, I'm gonna reattach the transmission kickdown cable to all the clips on that air chamber stay. And going from underneath is a little bit easier for the two lower ones, and that's what I'm gonna do. If you have this mud flap out of your way, you can get a nice access right here to clip it. Bottom two are clipped in, I'll get the upper ones and then it clips right in here like so. This is a bracket that holds the throttle cable to the plenum, and I didn't show removing this, but I did decide to take it off for this video because it makes it a little easier to work the ratchet to tighten up the air chamber stay. So it just connects right here. I got it reattached right here with a 10 millimeter bolt, and now I'm gonna grab the throttle cable. And I'm gonna slide it into here like so. And then the throttle cable comes around here and gets captured right here. I need to reconnect the vacuum hose that goes to the brake booster. I'm gonna reconnect this vacuum hose right here. I'm gonna route this hose that goes from the EVAP canister. I'm just gonna plug it right in here right now. And then this thing connects right here. Next, I'm gonna get the throttle body reconnected. I get the coolant hoses connected first and then I slide it in place. So I have some plugs plugging it off. This has been an area where people have made a gross error because you have the air assist hose here, which is a bigger nipple, and then you have the two smaller coolant pipes that run right across from each other. And what somebody ends up doing is hooks up one of the coolant hoses to the air assist hose and then when they start the engine, they flood their cylinders with coolant and they basically hydro lock their engine. Not good. So make sure that you're getting the coolant hoses connected properly. Now I just got to get my pliers and get the clamps in place. 
Now I'm gonna slide the throttle body onto the studs of the upper plenum. Now I'm gonna slide the air assist over the nipple here. There we go. Now I'm gonna install the bolts and nuts that hold the throttle body to the plenum. This would be an excellent time to do a cleaning of the throttle body and a good time to clean your IAC valve out. We have videos for that and we'll link them in the video description for you. The torque spec for these nuts and bolts for the throttle body is the same as the plenums. It's 13 foot pounds or 156 inch pounds. I'm gonna connect up the hose that goes to the PCV valve. I'm gonna reconnect the connector for the IAC valve. I'm gonna reconnect the connector for the throttle position sensor. Now I'm gonna reconnect the three cables. We have the throttle cable, transmission kick down cable, and then we have our cruise control cable. And just remember, if you have a 2001 or 2002 with the different throttle body, you're only gonna have one connection, a throttle cable. I'm gonna get the throttle cable reconnected first. I'm gonna twist the throttle body, get the lead end in, and then let it spring back. And then I'm gonna slide the cable over the post here. And then I'm gonna use two 14 millimeter open end wrenches to cinch these up. Okay, that's tight. I'm gonna get the transmission kick down cable connected. If you found that you had some slop in the cable, you can do an adjustment at these nuts and take some slack out of the cable. You want a little bit of slack, but not a ton. Same thing for this cable, two 14 millimeter open end wrenches and cinch it up. Okay, those are tight. Gonna get the cruise control cable. This one, I'm gonna rotate it to where I can get the lead end in. Rotate it back, put it into the bracket, cinch it up. Okay, those are tight. I'm gonna reattach this hose that leads to the back of the throttle body. I'm going to reinstall the air box. You got two bolts with the special sleeves and you got a regular bolt. The regular bolt goes here at the front and then the ones with the sleeves go down below. No torque value for these. I'm just going by feel. Okay. Those are all good and tight. Next, I'm going to get the air tube reconnected. I'm gonna tighten the air tube clamps with a 10 millimeter socket. I'm doing the final tightening with a short 3 8 ratchet. Okay, and that one's tight. I'm gonna connect up a hose here to the nipple of the silencer or resonator, whatever you call it. I'm gonna bring this hose over that goes all the way to the, the EVAP canister across the engine, snap it in here, and then it connects to this nipple on the air box. And this is just an easy clamp you can squeeze with your hand. I'm going to reconnect the mass airflow sensor. I'm going to connect up the harness right here to the air tube. This harness clips into a couple places on the air tube right here. This slides into a rubber grommet right here. One last thing right here, there's another hose that I have to reconnect right here. Sometimes the hose will pull off this plastic nipple. Sometimes the whole plastic nipple will pull out of the air tube. Lastly, going to get the battery reinstalled. Make your positive connection first. And I'll just cinch these up with a 10 millimeter socket. We're going to get the battery bracket reinstalled. The J hook has to hook into the body. And then we got to get the 12 millimeter bolt captured right here. All right, we are back to Sean's engine, the engine that we worked on. And what we're going to do is put a prayer into the wrenching gods. Oh, um. oh, and pray that we did everything right. I think we did. We were very careful in our approach to this. We double checked and triple checked everything. And it's the time 
that we just have to trust that we did everything right and turn that ignition key and hope that it starts up. Because when we were cleaning the block surface and we're using WD-40 and we're maybe getting some of that grit and runoff into the oil ports, we decided to drain the engine oil and we filled it up with a really affordable oil, not the one that we're gonna end up with. We're gonna run the engine just for a short period of time and then hope any contaminants in the oil are caught by the oil filter and then we're gonna shut it down, we're gonna drain that oil out, replace the filter, put some fresh oil in, and then the engine lubrication should be good. Another thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a complete flush procedure of the cooling system because a while back, Sean had a radiator failure and he mixed some Xerox coolant with some Toyota coolant and that's not necessarily ideal. So we're gonna do a flush with distilled water and we're not gonna show that process because we have a video in existence for that. If you click on the link above, you can see that video. Or you can check the video description, we'll have links there. So it's time. We're gonna turn the key and hope that it starts up. Now you just have to know that there can be a little bit of a delay because we cracked open fuel lines, so it's gonna take a little while for the fuel pressure to build up. So that's normal. Don't worry if it doesn't crank over right away. Let's do it. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So after you get it started, you'll want to do a quick look underneath the vehicle, on the sides of the vehicle, everywhere, and just check for any obvious leaks that you're not just pouring out engine oil or coolant, something of that nature. Once you do a quick search and you don't see any leaks, you're most likely good to go, and you can call it good. If you're noticing the smoke coming up, that's just some residue of penetrant and maybe some oil that leaked onto the exhaust manifold. So that's gonna be normal. It's just gonna eventually burn off. All right, there's the URD pulley. It's so red and so fancy. So check it out. This is some grit that worked its way out of the cooling system. And this is one of the reasons why we're flushing the system. Some of the junk that we cleaned off of the block surface made its way into the coolant ports and we want to get most of that junk out if we can. All right, we flushed the cooling system. We added some fresh 50-50 mix to the system. And now what we are going to do is we're going to do a compression check and we are hoping to see that the compression numbers on all six cylinders are awesome with these remanufactured heads from Yoda One Performance on this engine block that has somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 miles. We're gonna get it done and we'll report back the numbers to you. Here's the results of the compression check and they're really good. Starting on the passenger side of the engine, cylinder one, 210 PSI, Cylinder three, 210. Cylinder five, 215. On the driver's side of the engine, cylinder two, 205. Cylinder four, 210. Cylinder six, 210. So the low cylinder was number two at 205 and the high was cylinder five at 215. But those are really good numbers for an engine that has around 200,000 miles on the lower end and with remanufactured heads on the top end. So those are good numbers. And I would say this job was a success. Yay! Yay!
This was a pretty involved job to document for us. I'd say it's just as hard to document as the engine swaps we've done. It's a lot of work. And we learned stuff from doing this. We hope you learned a bunch from this video series. We hope you appreciate it. We hope you subscribe. If we didn't earn your subscription from this video series, there's nothing we can do other than maybe shit out golden eggs. I'd really like to thank Nick and Rebecca that own Yoda One Performance. They were a wealth of knowledge for us and helped us out big time. Not only by supplying us with the remanufactured heads, but allowing us to come to their facility and spend the day in their machine shop and just learn a bunch of cool things that we could share with you in this video series. That was an awesome experience for us. Probably, I would say the highlight of this series for us, other than right now, seeing that we actually did the job right and everything's looking really good. Visiting Yoda One and being able to witness how they do all the machining and how they build the heads and test the heads, that was a pretty cool experience for us. So thank you, Nick. Thank you, Rebecca, for allowing us to come to your facility and do some filming there. I'd also like to thank the Worse Than Chiggers YouTube channel. That guy, quite a while ago, did a really good series on this job of replacing a head on a 3.4 liter V6 Toyota engine. And I used that video as a reference at first to see what the job entailed. And then from there, I basically did what that guy did. And I used the factory service manual pretty heavily to learn all the proper steps to remove the heads and get the new heads on. I would have to say this is the most involved job that we've done on this engine, short of rebuilding an engine, and I'm never going to rebuild one of these engines. I'm going to leave rebuilding an engine to the professionals like Yoda One Performance because I don't have the tooling that they have. They have the big fancy resurfacing machines. They have all kinds of cool stuff there, stuff that I would never own in a million years. So. I think that replacing heads on one of these engines is probably as big of a job a DIYer would ever want to do on one of these engines. And with the age of these vehicles getting up there and the mileage getting up there, lots of guys and gals will probably be looking at replacing a head at some point in the future if they keep their vehicle long enough. It's just a matter of time and miles before you're gonna be looking at the same job we just showed you how to do. So Sean and I believe you can do this too. If you follow along, you take your time, you're really organized, then you could easily do this job no problem. Now, that's not saying that you're not gonna have some struggles, like you're just one broken bolt or nut away from having a real frustrating experience, but you can absolutely do this stuff and we encourage you to challenge yourself and just take a project like this on because if you bring your vehicle to a shop and you said, hey, I have a misfire, my engine's eating coolant, can you check it out for me? And then they're gonna come back and say, yep, uh, we need to put some new heads on your engine. That bill is gonna be massive. It's gonna be huge. That's where it gets to the point where if you're gonna just pay a shop to do it, you may as well just pay a shop to put a quality rebuilt engine in it because at that point, if you're gonna be paying all that labor for them to replace heads, I think the money is better spent on a rebuilt engine. But we're hoping that this video is gonna inspire you to take on the challenge. And if you are in a situation where your engine doesn't have a ton of miles on it, then it's worth rolling the dice like Sean chose to do and put some remanufactured heads on the top of this 3.4 liter engine or you put some new heads on because there's some pretty quality heads coming out of China. There's nobody forging heads in the US currently. You can get a lot more miles out of these engines by placing some remanufactured or new heads on top of it and drive happily for hundreds of thousands of more miles, no problem. So again, we hope this series inspires you to tackle this job on your own. And at the very least, if you don't 
tackle the job on your own, you at least know what it entails and it might make you feel better when the mechanic shop gives you that huge bill for doing the work for you. So there it is there. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. We will, of course, be back with more videos. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, click that subscribe button and also click on that notification bell if you want to be notified when we put up new content on our channel. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Sick mods and sick head replacements on the Toyota 3.4 liter V6 5VZ-FE engine. Bye-bye. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs>